This is the final period of Mayan development, the post-classic era. And the Maya of this period, they don't really go further uh, in many ways than the Maya of the classic period. Uh, they kind of plateau. And this is really the final collapse of the Maya. Uh, every Mayan person does not die when the Spanish arrive, but certainly the arrival of the Spanish uh, brings any traditional type of Mayan existence to an end, uh, or at least very, very radically changes it. So let's just look at a couple main ideas for this period. Uh, power is going to shift up the Yucatan again. Remember, we started down by the Pacific coast. Uh, we went up to the middle of the Yucatan there, or lower Yucatan, and now we're all the way up to the northern top. We're going to see the Toltecs come in and influence the Maya. Uh, a lot of war, and like I said, the Spanish are really going to put an end to this period. Always good to look at a map. Uh, there at the bottom, you see the classic era cities, Tikal, Palenque, that we just examined. Uh, those were more powerful uh, in many ways than any of these cities up here of the north. Uh, our most important post-classic cities are going to be Uxmal, Mayapan, and of course Chichen Itza. And that'll be the first place we talk about here. Chichen Itza uh, really kind of comes into uh, play or, you know, becomes a major city around 900, 1,000. And uh, it becomes really a major center for trade. Uh, they kind of retain some of the old links that the Mayan classic era cities had with uh, the lands of central Mexico. They bring in obsidian, other fine products and things like that. And here at Chichen Itza, we see fine architecture uh, that was kind of typical of Mayans of this period. And we see the most ball courts, uh, more than any other city throughout any period of Mayan history. Um, one other thing, or sorry, two other things that we find here at Chichen Itza are cenotes. And the cenotes were an important part of the city. Uh, one was for drinking water, provided fresh water for the inhabitants, and the other was for sacrifices. Um, some say this is called the sacred cenote or the well of sacrifices. Uh, they've dredged it, they found a lot of bones, a lot of remains um, of objects that were sacrificed. Um, and yes, um, it seems like people were thrown in there and uh, left to die for the gods. Chichen Itza was a very cosmopolitan city, and uh, this map up there in the upper left, you can see Tula. And when Tula fell, around 1,000, uh, its inhabitants began to migrate towards the east. And what they did was they ended up in the Yucatan, the northern Yucatan, and they brought with them, um, amongst other things, uh, their culture. And this Toltec culture uh, influenced the northern Yucatan in a variety of ways. There's some debate about this today, uh, but many people think that the kind of uh, violent, aggressive edge that was a part of post-classic life was brought by the Toltec. One other thing that was, was architecture. Uh, here you see these columns, these were kind of Toltec influenced, um, and they are prominent around the city of Chichen Itza. Let's focus on Toltecs for just a couple more moments here. Um, like I said in the previous slide, their capital was Tula, and northwest of Mexico City, which is also going to be northwest of Teotihuacan, Tenochtitlan, uh, the next city we're going to examine. And it really kind of, uh, it fills the power vacuum that existed after the fall of Teotihuacan. Remember, that city fell around 750 AD, which also influenced the fall of the classic era Maya. Uh, but in its wake, uh, in the wake of Teotihuacan, rises up Tula and the Toltec people who lived there. And so their city, uh, we don't need to look closely at that. That's not really going to be part of this course. But when that city does collapse, those guys, they begin to migrate to the east. And do keep that in mind because that's going to be important for our story about the Aztec, which is next. So uh, they end up at Chichen Itza and they bring along culture. And they bring along Coco Khan, and he's a familiar guy. If you remember, with the Olmec, they worshipped the feathered serpent. And at Teotihuacan, we saw the feathered serpent. And yes, the Zapotec also had the feathered serpent. Well, here he is. He's not called Quetzalcoatl yet. He's called Cococan. Quetzalcoatl will be the Aztec version, the one that will be used in Tenochtitlan. So, we're almost there. <clears throat> but this is another example of shared gods and shared culture throughout the region. They also bring with them these warrior statues, and here you see them to the left. Uh, we talked about the columns already, but these warrior statues, um, they are well, quite impressive, uh, very fine craftsmanship, and they're huge. Uh, the next slide will kind of give you some uh, sense of how big they are when you see how small the people look next to them. And the final thing are these chalk mules, um, another <clears throat> uh, type of statue that they brought with them, and we're actually not really sure uh, what their purpose was, although a lot of people think that it had something to do with sacrifice. So you can see those here on the next slide. The ruling family in Chichen Itza 
uh, really, its power began to decline by the 1200s. Um, essentially, Mayapan is going to replace Chichen Itza as the most powerful city in the post-classic era. But let's take a look at this map, uh, this tourist map of Chichen Itza from today. And let's point some things out that are important for the city to review, as well as some things that link the post-classic Mayan era to other groups that we've talked about. Let's start up top. We have the Well of Sacrifice, the Cenote. We've talked about that in this podcast. And moving down, we see a ball court, which is this Mesoamerican ball game that was really begun by the Olmec. Next to that, uh, to the right of that main ball court, uh, kind of the top center, the Temple of the Jaguars. And the Jaguar, of course, revered animal uh, by many groups throughout this region. Uh, below that, we see the platform of Venus. And Venus was one of the planets that the Maya specifically focused on. They were able to trace the path of Venus uh, thousands of years into the future, and they were only off by several hours. Um, we can confirm this today with telescopes. Of course, they did it uh, with their, you know, simply with their eyes. And going around there, we see Temple of the Warriors, you know, reflects this violent nature of the post-classic era. And all the way to the right of the map, yes, we have another ball court. And below that, another ball court. So down below, we can see the cenote uh, that was used for drinking water. Also, kind of down towards the bottom, bottom left area, you can see the observatory. And working our way up, we get to the high priest area, which makes sense, down by the center of the city, uh, near all the temples. And moving our way back to the center, you see the pyramid of Kokol Khan. Uh, he was the most important god to the city. Kokol Khan, of course, the feathered serpent. And his temple would be right smack dab in the middle. What happens next? Well, uh, this slide makes it pretty obvious. Chichen Itza falls and Mayapan takes its place. And Mayapan is going to go on to dominate uh, most of the northern Yucatan and even getting down into the middle and lower Yucatan, some of the cities down there. And Mayapan, um, as you might have guessed already, this is where the name Maya, the word Maya, actually is derived. Um, it refers to the people over whom they ruled. But it really wasn't used back then. Um, it what didn't catch on really until the 18th, 19th century. Cortez would have simply just called these cities by their name, uh, like he does for the Aztecs. The royal family at Mayapan, uh, they rule fairly brutally by any standard of the word. Um, they take families hostage, uh, bring them back to their capital city uh, to blackmail, to kind of coerce other leaders to do what they want. They're really not a nice bunch which makes it not so surprising that in 1450, the city was overthrown. And really, this, this all but brings to an end the post-classic Mayan era. Um, at this point, it breaks down into kind of warring factions, um, warring cities, no order, no kind of unity throughout the area. Um, so that when Cortes comes, when other Spaniards come, uh, arrive in the Yucatan, they they don't find much political unity um, and they're able to conquer it easier than they are other areas. And so uh, this guy here, uh, for those of you who have already seen Apocalypto, you might recognize him, but he's the high priest from Apocalypto. And that movie, which I suggest you do watch, it is a bit violent, but um, you know, one of the points there is that the Maya are, are kind of desperate by the time, by the time the post-classic era winds to a close. And you know, um, they're looking for help from their gods, and uh, in most cases, they're not finding it. And what they find is eventually the Spanish arrive. 